Hello and welcome back to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar. In this video I'll be making some comparative links between Sir Thomas Wyatt's poem Whoso Lister Hunt and F. Scott Fitzgerald's novella The Great Gatsby. So whilst Wyatt uses the Petrarchan sonnet form, which is very strong at revealing personal desires as it often concentrates on the themes of an unattainable love and passion, Fitzgerald centuries later uses Nick as our narrator to uncover the personal desires of characters including Gatsby, Tom and Daisy. The central comparative links I'll be making across this video include how women are possessions in both texts. Both texts hinge on marriage preventing women from being fulfilled. How love is a sport. Love seems imperfect and flawed where lust instead takes its place as a priority in each text. And there seems to be an impatience around love in each text. The difference about the state of love in the poem and the novella seems to hinge on the fact that in Wyatt's poem, he has tried to be with this person. But our speaker has now given up on pursuing it, or so they say, even though they do choose to write this poem. Gatsby, however, never gives up the chase for Daisy and in fact is almost martyred by his death at the end of the novella. When we unlock the title of Wyatt's poem, it translates into our modern English as whoever longs to hunt, I know the deer to pursue. And that sentiment seems to mirror Gatsby actually, who's got this simultaneous thrill and flippancy. But equally it mirrors Tom, even though he is not so much interested in the emotional side of relationship, simply lust after lust. I wonder whether Gatsby and the speaker care more about their egos than the lover in question. I discount Tom completely because I know the answer to that. He is completely consumed in his ego. As I offer you my rationale and potential links, I dare you to question, debate and leave in the comment section below your own interpretation. Let's begin by considering Nick's description of Gatsby, fixated on the past in chapter six. He talked a lot about the past and I gathered that he wanted to recover something, some idea of himself perhaps that had gone into loving Daisy. Fitzgerald then goes on to use Nick as the mouthpiece of Gatsby and describe him as confused and disordered. This notion of fixating on the past is shared between both texts. This seems really similar to Wyatt's speaker, who, as we'll uncover in line by line moments of analysis in a second, is equally dissatisfied that they're not with the hind. They've just accepted that it is not possible, but they're unhappy about that reality. Gatsby seems convinced his fulfillment is with Daisy but it's impossible. As the poet shares, to seek to hold the wind, you can't do that. But there's a rekindling of the past and its passion that is enacted in the mindset of both the character Gatsby and our speaker in the poem. Now, as we get into the nitty gritty of line by line analysis and comparison, these are my initial thoughts that I'm about to share with you on how this particular poem links to Gatsby. Feel free to pause though to see what your initial comparisons might be. I'll go then into even more depth in later parts of this video, really drawing out each of the comparisons I'm making. So as you'll note across this poem, there is a huge amount of first person vulnerability and shared experience, which echoes to some extent the self-indulgence of Gatsby sharing his own experience, albeit not in the first person by him being narrator at any points in the novella, but when sharing that experience with maybe Nick or Daisy as the novella unfolds. As with each text, the desired object, because they are objects unfortunately, whether that's the hind or Daisy, are problematised for us. We have to question whether they're too available or whether, in the case of Daisy, whether she gives up too quickly on her own ideal of love and settles, if you like, with Tom. 
because it seems like, alas, I may know more, that second line actually could be a line that we could imagine Daisy uttering. The vain travail hath weary me sore, or so sore, in line three, echoes the exhaustion of characters, whether that's George Wilson, who's controlled by his wife, who's cheating, whether it's Daisy's frustration at her marriage and her husband cheating, whether it's Gatsby just wishing that he had been given the chance to be her husband, or Myrtle, who just longs to be truly loved by Tom in a much more meaningful sense than the lustful pursuit that she is to him. Equally, line four, I am of them that farthest cometh behind. That line echoes so deeply with the lived experience of Gatsby, who is undeniably the biggest loser of the novella. He gets no further in pursuing Daisy than he did years before, as the novella unfolds. Yet truly it's line seven, fainting I follow. That line is interesting because it's got a full stop in the middle, it's a caesura there, and fainting I follow is the choice that Gatsby takes. But unlike the speaker of this poem who seems much more pragmatic after the caesura here, I leave off therefore. They decide, do you know what, I've wasted enough time. I'm not going to spend any further time pursuing this particular deer. Gatsby though is unable to do that and chooses to blindly follow love even though it's as desperate as seeking to hold the wind. Now if I speed on to the line that says engraven with diamonds and letters plain there is written her fair neck round about. We're given a glimpse into an echo of another piece of jewellery found in The Great Gatsby. The Pearl Necklace from Tom. It's another symbol of oppression, that marriage is an oppressive force, whether it's graven with diamonds that represent steadfastness in a marriage in the poem, or a symbol of future matrimony from Tom. Both Women are kept. Daisy's kept by Tom. And the speaker's love interest is kept by Caesar or the king. Or you could speculate, if you like, that Wyatt is talking about King Henry VIII's wife. The reality is the lines that occupy the last two of this poem, no let me tangere, for Caesar's I am and wild fall to hold though I seem tame, are fascinating. In both texts, these women are too hard to grasp and they're meant to be tame. And if you look at Gatsby as a text, each of these women are in some way subjugated to societal expectation or conflict around whether women should be tame or not. Daisy's both old money, she's upper class, yet she's a flapper, which goes against the occupied roles that she's meant to take of being mother and wife. Equally, we've got Myrtle, who is working class, subjugated by an unhappy marriage and tamed only by death. Jordan is an interesting example of a character who's restricted and engaged by the end of the novel in a sense that I don't really buy into. I think her sexuality is meant to be different and she's tamed by societal expectations. Yet there's an interesting distinction in the poem. The poem says, I'm too wild to hold. Yet in Gatsby, all these women are held. They're bound by expectation. And when Myrtle chooses to pursue lust, death takes its toll. So those are my initial thoughts. Let's now get into the nitty gritty. 
the opening line of Wyatt's poem has very clear echoes to the same sentiment shared by Tom in chapter seven of The Great Gatsby. Once in a while I go off on a spree and make a fool of myself, but I always come back and in my heart I love her all the time. So there's a mirroring of Tom's attitude and our speaker, because lust is a sport here. Love. Those words uttered by Tom, in my heart, I love her all the time. They don't really match his actions if he's pursuing sex with someone else. The casual references, both in the poem of hunting or a hind, referencing a deer as opposed to a woman, and spree, being a fool, imply indulgence, risk-taking, short-term fixes, so lust being the priority and therefore creating quite imperfect conditions for true love to flourish. Next up, let's consider line three of the poem. The vain travail hath wearied me so sore, my wearied mind. The major connection I have to being weary that I'm going to concentrate on is the way in which George Wilson's world falls apart in chapter seven. He discovered that Myrtle had some sort of life apart from him in another world, and the shock had made him physically sick. So that's his reaction to Myrtle having an affair. And whilst the speaker and George are both wearied I'm suggesting to you that our sympathy is more readily available for George. The description of shock accentuates his emotional exhaustion because it's so unexpected. It makes him physically sick. Now the description around how he looks at that point, he's white, he's whitened with the shock of it. Or as we know, this is not the case for the speaker in Wyatt's poem. They've travelled this journey themselves. They've indulged themselves pursuing a person they cannot attain. But equally, if I were to concentrate on Gatsby, we will uncover that he cannot be free from his wearied mind. He continues to pursue what he knows he cannot have. What's so tragic for George Wilson in the novella is the fact that he desperately seeks a happy marriage. And the discovery of this other world for Myrtle brings his whole life crashing down. Now let's consider how our speaker binds with Gatsby. I seek to hold the wind trying to grip onto what you cannot physically touch. Now let's hear the words of Daisy and consider why Gatsby's in the same place. I love you now, isn't that enough? I can't help what's past. She began to sob helplessly. I did love him once, but I loved you too. Gatsby's eyes opened and closed. So he's not really getting what he needs. He wants Daisy to make some true admissions of everlasting love. For always, not just now, but forever. And it seems to me that he falls into the same trap as the speaker. Fainting, I follow. I correct myself. The speaker of the poem, before they got pragmatic, and so in chapter seven, Gatsby's reply is, you love me too. And therefore, as a consequence, there's a definite relationship there between how Gatsby feels and our speaker at the end of the poem. For the speaker and wild fall to hold, though I seem tame. These are the words not uttered, but engraved around the neck 
of the deer. I can't be tamed. I look it, but I am too wild for you to hold. That seems to be the summary of what happens in each text. Pursuit of love, unrealistic though it might seem, is never ending in a beautiful, neat bow. Instead, it ends in defeat. Love fails. Let's say a little more about this and graven with diamonds in letters. Let's consider Tom's rationale. She's not leaving me. Tom's words suddenly leaned down over Gatsby. Certainly not for a common swindler who'd have to steal the ring to put on her finger. Ouch. This is clear proof to me at least that Tom sees marriage as purely economic in its exchange. He feels he's bought Daisy honestly by marrying her. She won't leave. And that Gatsby would obviously have to do it dishonestly as a common swindler, stealing the ring on her finger. There's no word on what Daisy wants, because as in each text, love is about possession and control. In Who's List to Hunt, she's got a necklace round her neck. But women are symbols of a man's status or a man's needs. That is self-evident across each text. And I can't find any contrary example to share you or provide another alternative viewpoint on that. No lay me tangere for seas as I am, that chilling line about control within Whoso Lister Hunt. And let's pick up the story in Gatsby with Tom's very own rant, ironically, about self-control. Self-control, repeated Tom incredulously. I suppose the latest thing is to sit back and let Mr Nobody from nowhere make love to your wife. Well, if that's the idea, you can count me out. And then we're told he's standing alone on the last barrier of civilization. So Fitzgerald presents Tom as an absolute hypocrite at several pivotal moments across the novella. But his warped ideas really come out here. Uh, later on in this same chapter, Fitzgerald describes this rant as impassioned gibberish. And it's ironic, really, because Tom, as he's already told us multiple times, takes great pride in the fact that he can go on a spree but still come back to Daisy. Yet here he is, hearing and reacting to the news that Daisy is having an affair. And instead of acknowledging that he might be hurt and heartbroken or sad is deciding to pick up the idea of morality as if civilization itself is about to break down because Daisy has chosen to, chosen to be promiscuous. Now, it's interesting what Nick later says. Nick retelling Tom's view in the description, he describes him as moving from a libertine to a prig. Now, a libertine is a free-spirited, rather amoral character who lives life dangerously and doesn't care about the consequences. And yet here, he's moved from a libertine to a prig, who someone's quite um, righteous, knows the rules, is quite traditional. And I suppose here we have at the heart of the novella a similar parallel to Whoso List to Hunt. Both texts are grappling with hypocrisy. The women are owned by a master, whether it's Caesar or Tom. And their interests, their choices are nothing but to be viewed from the vantage point of that male gaze. Tom's assertion is simply, why should I have to chase my wife? Making love to his wife is not an interesting or worthwhile pursuit. Both Daisy and the speaker's former love interest are bound by marriage and definitely not fulfilled in it. At the heart of both texts there are questions about control, about what love should be, and there are questions left unanswered about why both speaker and core characters to Gatsby remain unfulfilled by love. Is that ever their choice? 
and were they ever given the chance to love? Why not subscribe to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar for all things English, literary and grammatical?